We've all probably made some furniture that looks like this, or this, or maybe this, but today I'll show you how to take your furniture modeling to the next level. I'll be showing you how to make this chair, but these methods can be applied to any other piece of furniture. These steps are research, modeling, materials, and lighting and rendering. Every piece of furniture, or really anything you model, should follow these four basic steps. You can always add in extra steps to further refine things, but these are the four fundamental steps for every model that you'll make. Here are some examples of furniture that I've modeled using all of these same techniques. And if you want, you can find them all on my GoPro page for only $3 if you want to support the channel. <clears throat> anyway, as I just mentioned, the first step is research. Yes, I know it sounds boring, but this is probably the most important step. The easiest and most reliable place to get both reference images and measurements is IKEA. Every product has multiple pictures from different angles in different lighting conditions, and most importantly, it also gives us the measurements for everything. Alternatively, you can even use Amazon. A lot of stuff on Amazon now has a 360 view, which makes modeling so much easier. Whatever site you choose, make sure that you find the measurements, because if you want to model realistic furniture, you need to use real-world scale, and it will also make the modeling process a little bit easier. Now that we have our reference images and measurements, we can jump into Blender and start blocking out our shape. The first thing I always do is add a cube or a cylinder with the dimensions of whatever I want to model. This will act as a guideline so that when we start adding all of the different pieces, they will all have to fit inside this shape. By default, Blender displays measurements in meters, but we can actually type in the inch amount that we want and it will convert it for us. In this case, the chair is 32 inches wide, 36 inches deep, and 30 inches tall. Now, looking from the right by pressing numpad 3, we can just drag one of our reference images straight into Blender and it will create an image plane for us. This plane is a regular Blender object, so you can move it, rotate it, scale it the same as any other object. So now let's just move it and scale it until it sits on the axis and fits inside the box. If you go to the properties of the image, you can also change the opacity so that you can see through it while modeling. The side of this chair is a fraction of a circle, so just add in a circle and scale and manipulate it until it matches the image. Then fill the circle with F and press I to inset it until we have the thickness of the piece. For anything round like this, insetting is a great way to get uniform thickness. Now all we have to do is delete the extra faces and do a bit more fine tuning to match the shape. Just make sure that two of the vertices line up with the second part of the leg that branches off because we'll be using that to model the other leg. Now just select those two vertices and extrude them all the way down to the feet and line them up. Now add in some loop cuts to the second leg and match it with the reference image. At this stage keep everything as low poly as possible because it'll make our lives easier and we can deal with the smoothness later. Now move the leg of the chair to one side to fit within our guideline box and add in a mirror modifier to give us the second leg. If your mirror doesn't look correct, press Ctrl A and apply all transforms. In most cases, if you're having any troubles with modifiers in Blender, it's likely because of bad transforms, so just apply them and everything should be fine. So now just extrude the back two vertices across on the x-axis and make sure to enable clipping in the mirror modifier. Now we want to add some thickness to this piece and because we're using real world scale, it makes it so much easier. Add a solidify modifier and type in how thick you want the arm to be. As I mentioned before, you can type in the unit, so in this case, the arm is going to be 2 inches thick. Now let's move on to the bottom portion of the chair. This is much easier than the arms. Add in a plane, scale it up, and move it until it fits the bottom part of the chair. Then extrude it up so that it creates the back. Now add a solidify modifier, make it 1 inch thick, and you're done. Those two pieces look good, but we need to make them a bit smoother. So add in a subdivision surface modifier by pressing Ctrl-1, and in edit mode, select all of the edges that we want to stay sharp. With all of these selected, Press Shift E and press 1 or drag your mouse until the line turns pink. Blender now knows that these edges are sharp and some of the modifiers will treat them differently. You can still see some faces along the curve of the arm and you might be tempted to turn up the amount of subdivisions, but there's a much easier way to do this. In object mode, all you need to do is right click and shade smooth. Now the shading looks terrible, but again another easy fix, go to the object data properties and enable auto smooth. Alternatively, you can just right-click and choose Shade Auto Smooth, and it does both these steps. I would also recommend right-clicking on the Auto Smooth checkbox and making it a quick favorite. This is a somewhat hidden feature in Blender, but you can hover over pretty much anything, right-click, and add it to your favorites, and you can access these by pressing Q. They're also context-sensitive, so the menu will change depending on where you open it. Now for probably the hardest part, the cushions. We can clearly see the seams of the cushions, so we're going to use those as our guidelines. We're going to create two cubes, and all you need to do is match them up with the seams of the cushions. We can do with how fluffy they are in a minute. Select all of the edges of the cube and press Ctrl E and increase the bevel weight to 1. This will allow us to create those seams later on. 
Next, add in a subdivision modifier. This will turn our cube into a bean, but that's fine. We can fix it by adding what are called holding edge loops. We could crease these seams like we did with the chair, but we don't want these to be very sharp. It's a cushion, it's supposed to look soft and round, so that's why we add holding edge loops instead. Add one edge loop to the center of the cushion, and now we can turn this edge into two by beveling it with Control-B. Beveling is a great way of making sure that the edges are spread evenly. So do this on all sides of the cushion until we have edge loops supporting all of the corners. Now we want to add a few more edge loops along the top of the cushion, maybe around five in each direction, until we have a nice grid on the top. And now we can start shaping it. There isn't really a science to this part, just view the model from every angle and using proportional editing, select the top vertices and move them upwards to create a curve along the top of the model. You can also press Alt-S to inflate certain parts, and this will push them out naturally. Now you can apply the subdivision by hovering over it and pressing Ctrl A because we're going to fine tune the shape some more with sculpting. If you were making a sofa or a cushion chair, you might need to spend some more time sculpting in details, but for this one we're going to keep it fairly simple. So now in sculpt mode, scroll down to the bottom of the list and choose mesh filter. The mesh filter tool allows you to do certain actions to the entire model, so in this case go to the top and choose smooth. Now click and drag until the edges of the cushion have softened a little bit more. Don't go too far with this or you'll lose all the definition. Now we're going to use the cloth brush to add a few subtle wrinkles and folds. Simply click and drag on any part of the model and you'll see that the surface starts to naturally fold and wrinkle like cloth. Be subtle with this because this cushion is fairly rigid so it wouldn't have a lot of wrinkles. Your cushion should look fairly good now, but we want to add a bit more definition to the seams. Remember how we set the bevel weight of the seams earlier? Now we can use a bevel modifier, set it to weight instead of angle and add a slight bevel to these edges. Turn on wireframe view just so we can clearly see what we're doing. Now give the bevel two segments and play with the size. I went for about three millimeters. Now go to the profile section of the modifier and turn the shape all the way down. With the shape set to 0.5, it will try to smoothly blend from one edge to the next, but by turning it up or down, we can decide if the bevel should go further in or out. Apply all of the modifiers now, and one more time in edit mode, select the center of all of these seams and press Alt S to push them a little further in to give them a bit more depth. Now we have the cushions in place, the wooden parts of the chair are modeled, but it's still missing something. We need bevels. If you look at all of the reference images, they all have a nice highlight along the edges, and the way to achieve that in Blender is by adding bevels. Add the bevel modifier to all of the wooden portions, set the segments to two, and again, use your eye and judge how big you think the bevel needs to be. They should only be a few millimeters at most. The reason we set the segments to two for all of the bevels is that this will then give us one edge in the middle of the bevel, which makes selections easier, which in turn will make it much easier to work with in the future. Now apply all of the modifiers and we'll move on to the materials. So there's two different ways you could do materials. If you're using this model purely for architectural rendering or arc fizz, then you can apply two separate materials to the model, one for the wood and one for the cushion. And if you have an asset library set up, then you can drag and drop different materials and preview them. But if you were to ever move or delete textures, then your model would end up looking like this. When making materials for games, however, you're generally trying to compress down everything as much as possible to save space. So you would only have one material and the wood and the cushions would just be separate parts of the texture. But then it is a little bit more difficult to change the materials later because they're baked into the textures. Regardless of what methods you pick, you will need to do UVs for both of them. So let's start on the UVs. Starting with the cushions, open up the UV editor window by dragging from the top left corner. In edit mode, select the interior seams of the model. You want to select a U along the top as well as the two front edges, mark the back two edges, and then press Ctrl E and mark these as seams. This seam selection might seem random, but that is just a pretty standard way of unwrapping a cube, which is what our cushion basically is. Select your model and press U to unwrap it. Do the same for the other cushion, it's the exact same process. If your UVs are still messing up, make sure to apply the transforms, Control A as I said before. If you're having any problems in Blender, most of the time that's the fix. Now to UV the legs. If you've already applied the mirror modifier, that's fine, just go to edit mode, delete half of the model and add the mirror modifier again. We don't want to have to UV both of the legs when we can save ourselves some time. Mark the seams along the edges, making sure to pay attention to the seam across the top of the leg and the seam at the back. The wood goes in a different direction at these seams, so mark the seams along these points and mark some more seams until you have some nice flat UV islands. Up until this point, everything has been separate objects, but now in object mode, select everything and join them all together with Ctrl J. Your shading might break, so just double check that auto smooth is enabled. Now select everything and unwrap it again. 
This time it will place all the islands evenly within the UV grid. In the UV window, add a new texture and make it a 4K color grid texture. We want to make sure that the UVs of the model look okay, so we use this texture to test it and make sure that everything looks good. Add a new material to your object, add your UV texture to the base color, and now you'll see how your UVs look. If you've done everything correctly, you should have nice even squares all around the model and the letters should be the same size. If there's any distortion, go into edit mode and with face selection turned on, just hover over the problem area and press L. This will only select up to the seams so you can diagnose any problems. Now if you press Shift H, this will hide everything except for the area that you've selected so that you can easily see what you need to fix. Then press Alt H to show everything again when you're finished. We want to make sure that all of our letters are facing the correct direction. The direction of the letters will determine the way that the textures are mapped, so we want the wood grain to flow in certain directions and the fabric to go in one direction. Lastly, we just want to ensure that the UVs aren't overlapping, so select all of the UVs and then we're going to average the island scale and secondly, pack the islands. Turn both of these into a quick favorite as well because it's much easier and quicker than going to the UV menu each time. With pack islands, just make sure that you disable rotation, otherwise it will undo all of the rotation work we just did. So now our UVs are finished. Separate the wooden parts of the model and the cushion by pressing P and now create separate materials for the cushion and the wood. Name them just to be sure that you don't get confused at any point. It can be very easy to add 20 materials to your object and then you're not sure if your wood was material.006 or material.009, so naming them is a good habit to get into. Now we need materials. You can try and create these procedurally using Blender's built-in textures, but that is a huge waste of time, so just go and download some. The two main ones that I use are Polygon and Textures.com. Polygon is primarily for industry professionals. The materials are great, but you do have to sign up and pay for credits. However, they do have a bunch of useful free textures, so download those ones and see if they work for you. I would only sign up for Polygon if you needed some very specific textures that you couldn't find anywhere else. Textures.com also uses a credit system, but you get 15 free credits every day, which would allow you to download maybe three or four materials. So do that every day for a month, and you'd have a library of over 100 materials to use in your projects. So we need a wood texture and a fabric texture. I'm going to use these ones, which are both from Polygon. Depending on which site you go with, you'll end up with a bunch of different textures. They'll have names telling you what they are, but these textures are used to create realistic materials using the PBR workflow. For our materials, you'll need a color texture, a roughness or specular or gloss texture, and a normal map. All you need to do is drag each of these textures into the shader editor in Blender and connect them up to the corresponding nodes. The most important thing to know is that underneath the texture, make sure that you change the roughness and normal to non-color data. We don't want Blender to treat these like normal color textures, so make sure to change them to non-color data. The only texture that should be color is the color texture. Lastly, the normal map is a special type of texture. You'll see that the node on the principal shader is purple, so we can't plug a yellow texture directly into a purple node. We need to convert it first, and we do this by adding in a normal map node. We now have a nicely modeled chair with nice materials, and now we need to present it well as if it were in a catalog or on the IKEA website. Most of the time, these models are presented on a plain white background with nice even lighting to showcase the product, so to match that, we need to add in a plane. Scale it up and extrude the edge behind the model upwards, then select the bottom edge and bevel it, and turn up the scroll wheel until you have a bunch of cuts. I would never bevel like this in any other circumstance, but this is just the background, it's never going to be used for anything else, so it's fine. Up until now, we've been using EV, so let's switch over to Cycles. Next, we need to work on the lighting. You could add in a sun lamp and some spotlights to try and light it nicely yourself, but there is a much easier way, and that's by using a HDRI. A HDRI is a special type of image that contains lighting information, so when we add it to our scene, it will emit light and cast shadows. You're probably wondering where to get HDRIs, and the main place that everyone goes to is Polyhaven. Everything on here is free, so go crazy, but we're looking for some studio lighting. You generally want to avoid anything too colorful, as that will then cast color onto our white background and the chair. We want it to be as neutral as possible, so pick something pretty plain as it will produce the best results. Now in the World Properties tab, add an environment texture and choose your HDRI. You should already see some nice lighting, but it would be nice to be able to rotate it. So under the Vector Properties, change it to Mapping, and then change the vector to Generated. Now we can use the Z rotation to rotate our HDRI to get some nice lighting. Now it's all about presentation. Add a camera and choose the aspect ratio to suit your model. In this case, I want it to be square. Now we can render our model by pressing F12. You might be waiting a while for this to finish depending on your PC because by default the render samples are set to 4096, which is way too high for our purposes. 
So cancel the render and change this to 128 or 256 and then just enable the denoising data render pass and in the compositor add the denoise node and attach everything. The denoising works perfectly fine for something like this. You only need a lot of samples if you're doing something with a lot of reflections or fog or subsurface scattering. Now we wait. And that's it. Now your chair is fully finished, so play around with some different looks. Maybe change the background color or change the fabric on the chairs and see how it affects the final look. Modeling something like this can be seemingly simple, but when you get into the specifics of sculpting, UVs, lighting, it can get a bit more complicated. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, it's use reference and get measurements. Those are probably the two easiest things to do, but a lot of people would try and model something from their imagination and it never looks real. So hopefully you can take some of the things that you've learned from this video to make any other piece of furniture. These are some examples of things that I've made myself, and no matter how complicated it may look, it will pretty much always follow the same steps. So remember, use reference, get measurements, and also apply the transforms.